you've found AHO Radio, where authentic human outliers come in together to help heal the fear of being authentic, to bring back genuine human conversation. No hype, no sensationalism, just honest talk about the critical issues affecting society, affecting humankind. And now, here are the hosts of AHO Radio, John Karotek and Bill Peratzman. Hey, John, greeting from the lower left corner of these United States here in sunny, but not quite so sunny today, San Diego. How are you, buddy? I'm doing great, Bill. You know, we're here on the West Coast. We're both West Coast guys, you know. I'm here just south of Tampa, and it is sunny. So what a great weekend and, uh, and a great way to start the week with Susan Ibitz today. Absolutely. Susan, we're so glad you're here. We're going to roll right into this, but I want to try to hide your superpower until a little later on okay. and, and just get you to talk about who you are. And... You know, I've been, I've been waiting for a while to ask this question. So it's going to be a bit of a challenge, but how did you first become aware of your superpower? How I become aware of what I can do? Yeah. Uh, somebody asked me something similar, and I says, it would be really sensational if I can say, I went to the Tibet and I spent nine years drinking water from the plants. Nope. I put myself to study for the last 28 years with everyone on the planet who does what I wanted to learn. And, but the journey, yes, it started with the story, with the story of my dad showing us quality time on the family and non quantity time. And my quality time with him was watching Colombo marathons. Remember, we didn't have a binge watching uh, 30, some 40 years ago. So I remember watching Colombo with him and like, oh my God, I want to be him. And we watched God, the Godfather. <laughs> At the age of 10, he gave me Nietzsche to read. And like, I was reading like way beyond my, my age. So my brain always worked differently. And I, I always said to my dad, I want to have the superpower to know what people are thinking. He wanted to be invisible. So we played this game. He wanted to be invisible. I wanted to read minds. And when I decided to, I was in the process to decide what I'm going to do to, to career, to go to college, I went to all the universities and I talked to one of the teachers and says, oh, what you want to learn is human behavior. You want to be profiling people. That's, that's not only a, ca a, a career on, on the FBI or different places. You even can do a PhD and go around the world researching people. And like, wait, I can get paid for this? I can do this? I can travel around the wall. Great. The problem was six months later, I found out that my teacher was like, one day called me to the office and says, I have a <laughs> di dichotomy with you. I have a problem. Your paper research art from a five years old, and you are an adult, extremely well versed and, and read. What is the problem? Like, it's like my, the words in my head cannot be translated on the paper. So he says, I suspect that maybe you have any kind of learning disability. And like, what? So mm -hmm. they, let, they, they sent me to the, um, sec uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how you call it here, but the department would analyze that kind mm -hmm. of things on the psychology university. And after five days, they come back with, I'm highly, highly dyslexic, but because my IQ is higher than a person who can have dyslexic, that, um, like, can of violence my intelligence so I can read a book and I remember the page, I remember what it says, but in order to retain it, retain it in order to translate it in a paper, I need to read it seven times. Mm -hmm. so for example, I read, I listen to audiobooks and read it at the same time, uh, seven times in a row, and I don't need to read it never again. I write articles. I was telling you guys, I wake up really late today because I went up to 4 o'clock in the morning writing an article, and not because it was wrong. It's because I needed to have all the information to make sure there is not a hole on the article to be perfect. So I have this convulsive about, about research and perfection because in order to become who I am, it took me double or triple work the other people would take it. So instead to go to the traditional career when you says, oh, who you, who you, who you are, oh, I'm the PhD on, or a master, MBI, no, I don't have any of those titles. So the title I have is the title of life and get me. I'm a, I'm a street smart, smart, I'm a certified smart, I'm an intellectual smart, 
and I become a human behavior hacker. Everybody deserves to have a title. Everybody put so many letters at the end of the names. Mine is human behavior hacker. No, I no, no. This. That's that's perfect. Yeah, I love this. What's what's awesome is that you're able to describe and understand your superhuman powers that a lot of people can't. And you know, the people that are watching are probably wondering, you know, why is John sitting in an interrogation room? Well, Susan Ibitz is on the show. And when Susan Ibitz is around, she is constantly evaluating people. Because after all, isn't this life about people? And being able to understand them makes it not necessarily easier, but maybe a lot more fulfilling to navigate. Would that be true? I have a phrase, I, I have certain slides that I always, and we were talking yesterday with the team, we need to make a few presentations, certain slides that but any circumstances are moved from the presentation. The first one is emotions are data, data is this deepness, deepness is knowledge, knowledge is power, the power to become humans again. So if you're waiting in yeah, my yeah. class to learn how to manipulate others, it's your decision, it's not what I'm going to teach you. Why? Because I'm not responsible for what, for what you're going to do. If I sell you a car and you choose to drink and drive and you hit someone, but this other person with another car than I sell them, coming back and pick up the person and take it to the hospital, what is the common denominator? I sell your car. Who is the bad? Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, the, yeah. Curse. The, 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 the irresponsible person who was drinking and driving, you. So what you choose to do with the power to become humans again, to communicate with others, it has nothing to do with me. That is your responsibility. With superpowers, come in responsibility. Thank you, Spider-Man and Lee for giving me that phrase because it synthesized really what happened. You cannot go in life saying, oh, you're lying, or you this, oh, now I know micro expressions, so I know when I'm lying. First of all, micro expressions are not to determine if somebody's lying. It's to determine when you see hot spots that you need to be paying attention. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's way deeper. And one of the things that it drives me crazy, and I work on the articles, is when I listen to video and says, oh, five 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 um five solutions to be irresistible uh five ways to find out is uh, your neighbor is still in your newspaper like <laughs> put a camera you want to know yeah. that yeah you're not going to be reading people you can use this power in a good way and sometimes for example i choose to go to a, a specific um table in a restaurant when i see that somebody mistreated the waitress before or I choose what, carry, uh, what line I want to go in the supermarket when I see that somebody mistreating someone. Yeah. So I come back and says, you know what? That person is so beneath you because you treat them with such a professionalism and that person deserves to be slapped on the face. Uh, congratulations, because I couldn't have managed the situation the way you did. You're really professional. If you need me, if he is going to complain about you and you need me to put a word with your manager, I will do it. Not fake if it really happened. That person smile. And for that moment, I make her or him feel good. Yeah. Why no? That people say free hacks. We're not going to be able to be giving free hack and kisses for a long time. I, at least I'm going to give you oxytocin. I'm going to make you smile. That is something. Yeah. 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 It's beautiful. I, I, know, had, yeah. I had a chance to watch some Zig Ziglar recently. It's been a long time. And when I first found him, he was, I could he only hear him. You'd get his tapes. But now you can see, like video. And the same kind of authenticity that radiates from Zig Ziglar radiates from you, Susan. And, and that is so powerful to me because I've, I've read your obituary, everybody. So just to let you know, I asked Susan for a bio. What I got was an obituary. And it's a wonderful thing to look back at your life and say, this is who I am or this is who I was. And, and in that that beautiful, um, I'm going to use the word, the introverted cocoon, because I use it too, to be able to, to withdraw from everything and just go back and recharge and then bring yourself to the world in a way that is authentic. That's a beautiful thing. And, and wh whatever the magic is that lets you do that, Susan, that's what uh, we're here to talk about. I want to I clarify something. 
it's really difficult if somebody freak me out when I have a conversation, a pre-conversation in a podcast or an interview. I have a chat who ended up in a conversation with Bill, and you specialize in music, and I says, well, I do have a song who represent me that, anyway, my dad gave me too, and is the one I want. That's how you, I ended up sending you my obituary and not my bio. And he says, I don't know if you can pick it up. And he says, oh, my way on Fran Sinatra. And I freaked out, like, how do you know that is my song? It's impossible that you can know that. Like, wait a minute. You're like me. You can read, you can read faces. You can profile people. That was freaky. So, Bill, I need to recognize, not in detriment to you, John. I haven't talked to you first, but Bill freaked me out that Friday. It's good to be freaked out. You know, it's, it's kind of... It kind of pulls you out. And, um, you know, when I think about what you were saying about interrogation and human behavior in the human behavior lab, um, you know, it's kind of a serious journey of self-actualization, you know. And I think what you just pointed out, this is just an opinion, you know, what they say about opinions. But I think that the more you become aware of you inside, you become more aware of what's on the outside. And I know that Bill and I had this conversation about six months ago. He said, man, the more I become aware of who I am, it's like this. It's frustrating because you start to see, not that you see through people in a shallow way, but you can read people really quickly. It goes in here. You can understand. And you've done this to thousands of people, Susan. You know who you can help, who you can't help. Who, you know what I mean? It's like twisting the nuts oh, and bolts. Oh, you can see the shadow in people. It, it, yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's amazing how you can see through someone. And when it says, oh, you can see through, yeah, because you don't have anything inside. So you have yeah, two yeah. ways to see people. When they have so much inside and nobody else yeah. has seen them. I have podcasts and situations where I make people cry. And in the beginning when I was doing this, I didn't knew how to manage. I'm not an empath. I'm not the kind of empath that is going on, pick you up from the floor and cry because I'm going to make a quote here. Yeah. Empathy can be really risky. Why? Because if you are depressed and I get in your same mood, depressed with you, now we have two people that need to be rescued. So you need to put the empathy when somebody who can balance you. When I study hostile negotiators and I, talked and trained them, I always says the same. Guys, your empathy need to save you first. Why? Because if somebody's about to jump from a, from a plane or somebody about to jump from a, a bridge and you grab the, that person, now we have two funerals to plan. So your empathy need to be saving you first so you can save others. So another thing that I learned is like when I make people cry, <clears throat> I didn't know what to do. And I went back to my teacher like, why am I making people cry? I'm a bad person. He says, no, you're doing something wonderful. And I start asking that, and I says, why? Ask the people why they cry. You freak that so much, you didn't ask. So I start asking, he says, why you cry? Because I find, finally, for the first time, A, I feel like somebody see me. B, I have the recognition that nobody else gave me because nobody else know what is going on with me. And yeah. third, I understand there's nothing wrong with me when I have been told so many times those are defect. And actually I found out there are the foundations yep. who I am today. Because if I don't have that, I wouldn't be having this either. So now I'm not a defect person. And I don't think nobody have the right to call that way another human being. It's, it should be illegal. You need to have the right to be the way you are. And this helping you to understand and see others. And it's funny when it, it's happened, going to um, a, a baseball game with a couple of friends. And I saw, another, uh, so, uh, I met an, a person that I have never met, met before, a couple. She have lines started on the nose and ending on the chin. Mm. Deep lines. Like most people think they're smoking line, but they're like, like, cut it on the face yeah. so I asked my friend and says how long since she lost a kid and he says how you know they lost a kid he doesn't have any lips all the features are the 
in a person who's completely negative about life. There is not, they don't think life is beautiful. <clears throat> and the lines of grieving she have on the face only happen when you lost a kid. And says, it's been 15 years, but she's getting worse now because the other kid is going to college and she knows that the one she lost should be going to college. So he like how you like those things that you learn. So after the game, we went for, for dinner and she ended up sitting next to me. And at one point before I left, without being intrusive, says, I see your pain and it's time for you to stop to start living and not grieving. I wish from the bottom of my heart that you can heal. Oh my God. Yeah. I ended up staying 45 more minutes because she ran outside, she went hysterical, and my friend says, you needed to open your mouth. Like, nobody's seen, nobody's understand it. Oh, so oh, no. I ran away with, um, after her outside, and I hug her, something that I don't do not really often, and says, keep crying. And she's like, who are you? Keep crying. And after 30 minutes of crying, she looked at me and says, thank you. I've been married for 35 years and my husband never, ever did that. We keep in contact. Sometimes we talk and it's, you know what is the crazy part? The lines start disappearing. She started therapy. She started going to a shelter to help kids at the same age where she lost her kid. So that process of helping other kids who doesn't have a house, and being recognized, and I swear to God, those lines start disappearing. And a statement analysis says when you say swear to God is a lie, but it's, <laughs> it's 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 the way to like it's real, it's it's freaking real. You know though, but thank you for sharing that story, and I'm so glad that you pointed out about not being drawn in with your empathy. You know, to be to empathize with yourself first, because you know, on one of my podcasts. I interview combat veterans. Every single story has something horrific in it. And I, un I know the feeling of making somebody cry. And it's a powerful thing. And what you did for that woman and the way you described it, Susan, is so flippin' authentically human. That's what makes you real. That's what makes that woman real. And that's what makes the world a better place. When we can be so authentic that it doesn't matter what goes on around us. All that matters right now to me is this conversation with you, Susan, and Bill. That's what makes living worthwhile. So yeah. thank you for pointing that out and how important that is that we don't get trapped in the sadness and depression of others, that we have this ability if we tap into it. So it gives me goosebumps. You just, you know, I'm, I'm like covered with goosebumps. It's, it, that's you know a good, what? thank you for that. No, thank you for allowing me to say it because it's a, a misconception and uh, everybody talk about, and one of the things that drive me crazy is when people talk about repeating things the other says. When people say, oh, <laughs> oh because God. empathy is so important. Okay, what is the definition on the dictionary of empathy, sympathy, and pity? Do you know the three differences? No. So don't use the word if you don't know what it means. Because yeah. I took the time to research. There you go. One yeah, is yeah. empathy, another is sympathy. Empathy is feeling your is is is, is camaraderie with you feeling your feelings. Yeah, sympathy is like understand what is going on. Pity is putting you down. So leaders need to use empathy in order to uplift their team. But if you empathize to the point that you get on this rabbit hole, the only talking about how bad we are, your team is not going to get out. Even though you're lost, maybe trying to lift your team, taking you out of your own rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. there are studies showing that from the depression in the 90s, from uh, the, the, the wars that we have from Vietnam, from Korea, for everything that we went through to the depression and after 9-11 and 2008, the companies and the leaders and the people who lifted up and become stronger when the work who stop feeling pity and empathy for their people in a way they make them feel worse is in the way you make you feel better. It's like, okay, I understand your situation, but you, we, you and I were talking because you have a work 
you have a roof and start concentrating. And this company is supporting you. So tomorrow you're gonna have a, you're gonna have a work too. So how are we gonna make it different tomorrow? How are we gonna go to the next step? How are you gonna lift yourself emotionally from the floor? Talk to HR and says, okay, we have a one of the biggest concern today is mental health. Yeah. And how help help people to get away of this rabbit hole of that people get sometimes I love to be by myself. I'm an introvert and nervous. So for me it's not a problem, but I know people who's having a really bad time. Yeah, so yeah. as a as a manager is your empathy requires to understand what is the needs of your people. As a manager, you cannot expect that everybody to read you. You need to read your people. So you need to understand what are the circumstances, not pushing people to be in video conference if they're not ready, not to asking for people for things that are not naturally the preference they can do because yeah. there wasn't the preference before. If a person was shy in a meeting, when it, 10 people was around, imagine when you are yourself only looking at you on the video and listen to you. They're not going to talk. So as a manager, send the agenda in advance, ask for questions to that person if that person is more introvert, more shy, or it's afraid to be in camera. Allow people to have meetings not to be in camera. I can close the camera, I can talk, I can share a presentation, I can share my thoughts, but I don't think that you're invading my personal space. So that is to me the concept of empathy, sympathy, and leadership. And Again, I told you a compulsive study, and I study from Batum's taking their team outside of that situation, yeah. protecting their team, taking out a way of the, the worst, uh, worst scenario from the people who take the team's leaders out. Actually, there are studies saying that there are no better leader for a team than somebody who has been on, on the field. Why? Because if I can take my team safe without being killed, I can save this company from going drowned. So some people is afraid to uh, um, hire ex-military. They're proven. I study with military. Military. I study with Mossad, Israel, Israel government, and believe me, they make me the toughest person you can see. Yeah, uh, that is so true. Yeah. Oh, they slap me on the face every time, and some of them are still in contact and says, Susan, I teach you better. Man up. What are you doing? Like, yes, sir. Some of them, I still call them sir. After 20 years, I study with them. That is the respect they profess yeah. to me. Not because I need, need to call them sir. It's because when I have a real problem that need to be fixed, they help me to see clear and get out of the emotional rapid hole that sometimes we get. And that's where I go for uh, advice. Not everybody's ready to be a leader, but somebody was the leader of the platoon. Hey, give it to my company. Everything is going to start working online. Absolutely. Well, yeah. I want to roll. I want to roll back to the moment when you decided to say something to the woman who lost her child. And, yes. And because my question is, um, you've talked about empathy and sympathy, but you deployed that. You went. You went forward with compassion. What made you decide to say something? I'm a, I'm a fixer. My, my definition, you have different empathies too. The same way that you have different intelligence, if I get the normal IQ test, I'm going below normal. It's like I have a problem. If you take me, uh, then IQ has to do with my type of intelligence, I'm going higher. So my empathy, you have three kind of empath. And after research, I... Divide, I subdivide it. So you have the empath who crying with you, the fixer, and the wave. The wave is the person who can be both things, the things needed at the time. Mine is a fixer. So um, some friends uh, make fun of me because they say, uh, you are a dude with some female attribution because I think like a man. <laughs> like I take action like a man. Again, I was, uh, I was trained by, by military. So my point was a fixing. It says, she have a problem. I can help her to fix it. Mm -hmm. So my empathy is coming from the fix it, f fixing point. So it's the same way I approach a company, the same way I approach a, com uh, a client, the same way I approach a friend or a relationship. And I have conflicts before because it's, I just wanted to vent. I don't want to fix the situation. Well, that's a fixer. So now when a friend or somebody comes to me and says, 
okay, do you want to vent? You want my opinion or you want to know how to fix it because you're too emotional to understand it? So I would like to say because it would make me look really good if I says my empathy part was the one getting their nose. No, it was like this woman need to know that is nothing wrong with her. It's a fixing thing that needs to be done that is human. That is the component that I would say I, I, I utilize, no use, utilize in that point as the human factor that she needed to be seen. And, some, and I can tell a lot of stories when this went really wrong, really wrong. Somebody went to grab me from the neck and almost snapped me because it was too strong, too personal for that person mm -hmm. to recognize what I told, told him. Mm -hmm. um, he came back and apologized to me, but at that moment it was scary. It was scary because I know he was stronger and bigger and I was under his power. And actually I grabbed the hand and says, if you push a little harder, you can snap my neck. Congratulations, you're stronger than I am. Outside, inside you're broken. So this is your chance to fix it or keep broken it. So it's your chance. If you push a little harder, you can get me in your hands. And he, retired, he went back. And people says like, why are you provoking? Like, no, I give him a shot of reality because he was anger. He was angry. And yeah. when you have anger, people have those blackouts when they don't remember. I see an interrogation where people get so mad that they do not really do not remember what happened. And he was yeah. going on that. So what I needed is a distraction. Like when people is going to be attacked, they said, oh, monkey, monkey. They start doing stupid things. And the rover is like, oh, my God, you're crazy. I'm going to go to the next victim. So it was the same. I needed to use a distraction, and I learned in interrogation when somebody gets to violence. So i coming back to my training. You need to know how to be human with the things that you have. <clears throat> I'm not going to be someone that I'm not. I'm going to do the best with what I have. And that's what I learn, that's what I teach, and that's what I live for. Sorry, my cats are... On the, no, no, no. The day they running around the house, right? Like, Mama is our time. I get that. Well, thanks for explaining that. You know, so let's just say, Susan, I'm a I'm a manager in a medium sized company, okay, and we're having some issues with personnel, and there's some personalities that aren't jiving that maybe got along at one time. How can I how can I approach the human behavior lab, and how can the human be behavior lab help me solve my company problem. I like something that you said, John. Uh, I don't work with companies too big. I have done it. I still do it. But I like the middle size to small companies because I still can know the names and I can talk to everybody involved in the middle. So there are a few situations that I help. 60% of the managers, they don't know what they need to do because they don't have a description. Actually, we take the time to go five years uh, behind on everything that described to be a manager. Most of the positions are general. So before we go into a company, we review everything that the position requires for the person that we're going to be working with. Yeah. So when we're talking about a manager, we help the manager to read the basic needs of their uh, team. Introversion and extroversion first. Intuition and sensing. <clears throat> Why? because you can see the tree and other people can see the forest. So people is not trying to drive in you crazy on purpose. It's the way the brain works is the preferences. When you understand that people is not bad or good, driving you crazy is preference, you relax because now you know who you need to pair with. Once we do, do that simple exercise that taken us around three hours where we put introvert and extrovert in different situations, the next step is, okay, if your team a sales team, what they need to be trained on. They know about the product, they know about all the code of ethics of the company, but behavioral wise they don't know how to work with other coworkers, when to pair with them, and how to read the customers to A. I always say a good sales team is not the a sell person is not the one who sells you what they need to sell, is they sell you what you need. So if I can save you a month of painful emails and conversations to get to a cell and I can narrow you in a minute knowing what you know and what you need based on your needs. Now I have 
something that is cheaper than looking for another customer if I can retain the same one. It's more expensive to a company to look for new customers than work with the same one they have. So knowing the needs of your customer are the idea how a company grows. If I, not, if I, if I sell in, for example, microphones, and now then I know that because I talk to my customers, what else beside, beside microphone surrounded what you do, you're going to need cameras, mouse, keyboard. So I start bringing those products, my company grows, I already have a center of customers, then I can sell. Why? Because my employees, my people become my market research. Yeah. So from something tangible to intangible, I can help from a CEO of a company who is afraid to uh, public speaking to show them confidence, how to show confidence without being cocky. Most people ended up being like alpha male cocky and that's what I drive by. And like, sir, it's not. Oh, yeah. yeah. And like <laughs> yelling, uh, you get more with a spoon of sugar than uh, a punch in the face. And I can help you to be more human without being looking sissy. And for women, try Sometimes they're overdo it, and I need to put myself an example. When I start doing corporate training, yeah. well, I start training policemen and cost a negotiator, I come up too strong, like too strong. I see our videos and like, oh my God, I should know better. So I help other women to show um, power, um, not to be taken in consideration, and how you don't need to lose yourself or you, the, the, the fact that you're a woman to lead in a team, how to lead a team. But basically, we train teams to become platoons. I put, that's the reason I use a lot of military tactics, because I use exercise when people can understand each other. Because in a crisis like this, if everybody is by themselves, now we lost the ship. It's done. It's sunken. Yeah. So your first client is your employee. So I work with managers, and that's the reason I like small companies, because I have the chance to train all the people at the same time from the person who pick up the phone who is the most important important people in your company you know what is the first person people is going to be talking to yeah yeah so if the person who pick up the phone doesn't understand what is going on it's going to be a problem yeah i'm going to give you an example a company called me it was like two or three years ago um this person working from home and the manager called and says we have an uh, critical emergency and this is going to blow on the media we need to talk to you first I'm like yeah what happened one of my sales team uh, went to the doctor and because he didn't want to tell me he's going to the doctor he transferred his cell phone to his wife you know what happened mm -hmm. the biggest customer this person have called with an emergency the wives start rumbling and like well um and uh yeah I was like I need help who I need to talk my system is frozen, my people is not working, what I do. Husband didn't have the cell phone, was for an hour and a half until he came back. By the time he came back, the customer called the company, canceled the contract with the lawyer on the, on the phone, put a horrible review, and w no way, after wow. six months trying to work, yeah. we couldn't get that customer go back until he finally accepted having an interview with me what happened. And he says, I felt frustrated because I never need anything, but what I needed, I felt left down. So one of the things that we do is, like, when you're going to transfer your phone to somebody in your family or somebody in your organization, you need to know the change of command. What is and under, since you guys are in the military and most people know about this and understand the, the, the jargon that we use and I'm going to keep it. You need to know the, the line of command in a crisis. Who you go, so I have A, where I go. I have B, where I go. I have C, what is my line of command. So if somebody called with a problem, I need to go to IT direct. Uh, that's the same things that we do in customer service and, and call centers. This is what you teaching in call centers, change of command. Yeah. using words the other people need. Somebody says, I feeling left behind. Sir, you're not left behind. You shouldn't be feeling left behind. I repeat in the word, left behind, reinforce it, and transfer. That's when you need to know. Most people doesn't know when to quit. Quit is not being 
failing. Quit is no when you are not the right person to keep that conversation and what to transfer. So yeah, yeah. what we did with that company is since most of the people already was working from home, who is going to be transferring your phone? Who is going to pick up your phone if you're not home? Your wife. Okay, she needs to be on the training. Why? Because she needs to know at least what she needs to do when That's you're not enough. present because you're human. You have the right to go to the doctor. First, you should, should, you should ask. My second question was to the manager, why this person have the need to lie to you about going to the doctor? Anais Nim used to say, uh, why the people have the need to lie to you? It's not only that people want to lie, it's sometimes they have the need because they don't have another option. Mm -hmm. So you need to change your line, you need to change your line of command. One, I need to feel safe, emotionally safe. B, I need to be able to talk to you. Three, you need to be able to allow me to talk to you. That would be save the problem who cost you so much money, loosen the customer and have a bad repute, a reputation in the media. Why? We didn't have a line of command how we need to transfer the phone. Look how crazy a situation can yeah. be to the point they need to f uh, hire a fixer and a profiler to redo the company for how much damage that did to the company and their yeah. public reputation. Let's do the reveal now so everybody yeah. knows what your superpower is because people, Susan is like one of two people in the world that does this at this level. So um, I, I, I won't say it, Susan. I'll let, you t I'll let you describe it. So what's your superpower? My superpower is I can, first of all, read your face. First step, I can read your face and determine how you intake information, how you process information, how I need to talk to you. If I need to tell the story, if I need to talk facts and data, or you need analysis, like pointy eyebrows, again, I need to research and analyze everything. My small ears telling me that I'm visual, and I need to process information on my own time. You, I, I'm teaching people how to read faces with masks. The part of your face that we read the most when we're talking about selling, yeah, cover your face, Bill. Uh, when we talking about sales or basic communication, we have been teaching people on banks, hospital, fire departments, policemen, how to read faces with masks. Why? Because the important part of how I need to communicate with you to make sure that you follow procedures or I know what your our needs are, doesn't need to be shown without a mask. So that's the first things. The forehead, the ears, high, low, stick out and stick in shape of the eyebrows, type of the eyebrows, where the eyebrows start and end, how much eyelid you're showing, what is the distance between your eyelid and your eyebrows, the flatten of your eyes. So like I can easily read between 27 and 30 things, even though if you have your nose cover from the tip of the, the bridge of the nose can be read. I like, you, I, you can determine, I can determine somebody's a quarterback or is ex-military reading the top of the of the of the nose so that's how much in an airport for example when people are not going to take the mask how you order or tell people what to do that is really important once i know how you intake and process information now i have the goal the, the pot of goal i know how to talk to you so when i talk to you i can use the right words i can use auditory words i can use visual words or i, I can use visual kinetic. More, vis more people are visual kinetic than audio kinetic. Kinetic is I feel it. I can see why you feel that way. People who listen tend to lower the head because 75% of the things happen on the listening. Through they the can repeat everything that you said, even though when you think they're not paying attention. They're yeah. going to repeat all the worlds. And you know, Bill, because you're in music, uh, auditory people have a different way to set the brain. So I know how I need to talk to you. And when I'm in person with you, I can know based on the micro expressions, what is your first reaction and how your body react. Mm -hmm. Know if you're lying. Lying is another art who bring statement analysis, forensic analysis, um, persuasion, the use of space, the use of time, the silence is another, another craft. But I can do know, for example, do you know what is the most danger micro expression nobody talks about it that is the hallway of hell no but i'm anxious to hear yeah 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 surprise, yeah, yeah. surprise. Hmm. you know when navi seals are training 
one of the training they do is they put a mask on the head. They have a black room and suddenly they have different objects they need to shoot. They take the mask and light the room and they need to shoot the, to the right target. The amygdala needs to be the repressed in order to not be afraid because they're not surprised. Yeah. Surprise can lead you to fear. Surprise can lead you to happiness. Surprise can lead you to anger. Why? Because when you get surprised, you go to this craziness in your brain that you don't know what is next. Example, I'm going on the street with my kid, holding my kid, three years old, and suddenly I hear something like can, can be a, sh uh, a bullet. That is the back of the car. I have, how do you name them? The backfire. The, the backfire. Yep. So initially, you don't know if that's a shooting. In Chicago, most people are like, get down. Like, <laughs> no, wait, wait, it's a car. So you feel surprised because you feel, and after that, you feel fear because you don't know what happened. And after fear, you, ha you have anger. So that situation is blowing out. Imagine you go into a job interview and that happened to you. So when people say, oh, my God, the person is surprised. And what happened after? Oh, I wasn't looking. Hello? If, you, if I see my ex or my partner with somebody in a bar kissing, first is going to be surprised. Next, I'm going to slap you. If I got a surprise party, oh, my God, thank you, is going to be happiness. So you need to be careful with the expressions and how people train others how to use expressions. Because, again, it's a lot of people talking about things they don't know. And now most people, because they don't want to lose the client they have, they offer behavioral training, they offer micro-expression training, they offer body language. Oh, we're going to show you how to get your clients in five minutes. Dude, three months ago, you didn't have an idea what I'm talking about, and now you're teaching it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't get in your turf, don't get in mine. I'm not going to be anybody t teaching anybody how to sell because that will be misrespecting my customers and me respecting my people. But don't. Please do not promote yourself, you know what you're doing. Because when I ask this question, I'm like, oh, yeah, they say disgust and contempt. Yeah, those are situations that you cannot come back. It is really difficult to come back and you need to read. So before you leave our meeting, because the most important part in a meeting is hello and goodbye. It's how you make me feel, how I leave in the meeting. If I leave the meeting with this this car, a dislike, like yes. well, I reject you or contempt and I feel superior to you and you mix it with smile, that's the feeling the person is going to leave the meeting with. That is danger. Dr. Gauman in Seattle says is the only way you know when a couple is going to get divorced or uh, uh, two people is going to get break apart in a business situation when that is the preponderant on the communication. Mm -hmm. But surprise, nobody explained you how danger it is. So. Sometimes when I when I says when I teach micro expression to people, I put a really really annoying noise about a glass broken, and people get surprised. And when I tell them what they did, ninety percent get pissed off. And says the next time you tell me surprise is the best thing who can happen. Can you please remember the feeling you have now? So next time you see surprise, think, don't react. You know that that's fascinating. You know. You pointed out something that's just awesome because we encounter it every day. People saying things and doing things and promoting things that they know nothing about. And I mean, and I think that what happens, maybe you can shed some light, but I think people become desensitized. And then for a company that's trying to do the right thing, they get lost in the noise or they get lost in this, uh, you know, misconception or this perception Oh, they're just another one of those. Do you, do you, a couple of questions. Do you have like a favorite book, Susan? And do you have, do you have a personal mantra that you live by every day? I have a couple of books. I don't have one. I have a couple of books that I read every year. Um, one of them, it's, it's funny because it has to do with uh, how to domesticate your dog. Uh, because, uh, for example, humans and, and animals, we share something. We can smell fear. So when I started studying microexpressions with Polygon International in, in UK, they start talking about the expressions, and my brain, way brain again, 
this wire different this it says <laughs> okay this is the expression but you have all this study but i still don't understand what it's doing to me and they like look at me like why are you so difficult like no what it meant fear what is coming from why is freeze froze or attack so I start going to the nature and i found out why some animals play dead possums they play dead froze so nobody want another animal doesn't want to eat something that is dead so I have this weird collection of books. I have books of selling because I want to understand the selling process, the emotional selling process. So I read those books. I love to read Lena Sisko. Lie to me. She was one of my uh, one of my teachers in interrogation, and she's a, a lovely person. She was an interrogator in Guantanamo, and she started being an archaeologist. And she says, if I can make mommies to talk, I can make people to confess. And she's right. Um, I read books about uh, philosophy to understand and uh, weird to explain, but basically has to do with uh, behavioral. And I, I have four or five books that I, that I read. I cannot give you one like all oh, that is. Mm -hmm. I think one of the ones who I love to read is Machiavello. Oh, the prince. <laughs> the yeah, prince. Yeah, yeah. Who doesn't love the prince? And another yeah. one that I always, always read is Oscar Wilde. Oh, I beautiful. Think. Awesome. But not, not the complete literature, the phrases, the strut. Like, you never be overdressed or overeducated. People forget everything except success. And another one is, you, you're always going to be fond of me because I represent to you all the sins that you never have the courage to commit. Wow! When I read that <laughs> phrase, it blew my mind. So what's, so what's the Susan Ibitz mantra? You know, if, if you had one thing that you think about every day what would that what would that be oh my god i need to get my ass out of the bed i was so <laughs> hey that's I, a good one <laughs> that's a good mantra <laughs> and you did it no it's good no what i'm saying is like everybody everybody think that i really again i didn't went to the thai tibet to meditate it's like i work until four o'clock in the morning because that's when my brain worked the best Actually, I have a meeting with one of my team last night, 11 p.m. She worked at night because she had small kids. And I was so wired, I couldn't sleep. So sometime in the morning, it's like, why? The morning came so early. Okay, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. It's your fault. You was until 5 o'clock in the morning. You need to unwire your brain early. So now your punishment, you need to get out of the bed. And like slowly, and I get to my mirror, and I do the bot fox on all that jazz. I put my to music with ACDC, get on myself on the mirror, put cold water and put my head there and like, okay, let's go for it. <laughs> nice. You know, and ACDC, I'm back in black. You know, I love that song. That's one of the one I use. Yeah. Yeah. I, did, I do the bot fobs for, um, yeah. and I build, I'm sure I'm, I'm pronouncing the, the name bad from all the jazz when he went to the cabinet, closed the cabinet, like, <laughs> show must go on, all yeah. that jazz. I do the same. I have a radio in, I have speakers in my bathroom for that reason. <laughs> have cool. you heard, I have to ask you this because it came up last week. Have you heard the who? H-U? Yeah. Or Mongolian. The Mongolians, yeah, they're cool. Wow. My new Powerful. favorite go-to um, Mongolian we, metal band. We the grow up of the on wolf. the best music. We grow up on the same music, the best music uh, era, I think, on the 80s. Oh, yeah. How many of the 80s band still there? Okay, go oh, to see gosh. the Rolling Stone. Go to see Ozzy Osbourne. He has so many healthy issues besides he should be on the Guinness for being alive. You <laughs> saw him on the stage. And, like, this dude is, like, my grandfather and the Stones. Like, you going to see, yeah, I went yeah. to see yeah. ACDC before the last um, guitar player uh, retired. And I was like, oh, my, holy moly. Incredible, what a yeah. show. I, the Rolling Stones. And there are people that I didn't have the chance to, to see when I was young, and I regret it. But I don't know how many artists <laughs> born in the 2000s and 2010 and up they're going to be there in 20, 30 years or 40 years. That is music. I know we're yeah, going to yeah. touch some sensitive people that are like, hello, we grow in the best era on the 80s. Yes. No, 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 no. You're so correct. Yes. You know, it's and longevity. The music that, yeah, it's longevity and it's music that we can relate to. And, you know, ACDC is great that you, that you bring them up because the only way to listen to ACDC 
is loud. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and you can hear every little instrument and nuance. They're they're phenomenal. People don't give ACDC credit like they like they deserve, but that's awesome. <laughs> People don't get so many things, John. If we need to make a list, just, you know what? I that's pick true, up my Dennis. fight when somebody says, "Oh, Justin Bieber." I just not to answer like is it where he is now? Uh, like I don't take the credit. Then maybe he was a gifted person, but didn't know what to do with that. Yeah. So move on. Tell me what he's going to be in 10 years. I don't agree with a lot of things with Beyonce, but every show is perfection. Why? Because she has a pointy eyebrow on her professional side. And I talked to a stage manager who worked with her and says, I, for the first time in my life, I felt that somebody is giving me my money for free. She knew even the cue of the microphone, even before the audio person told her the cue is right. She's nice. such a performer, such a perfection. Lady Gaga, everybody see the girl who did the marketing, but after hearing and seeing her and the, um, the, born, the, the star is born, the literally of the music, like, wow, I didn't know she wrote the, the songs. It's like, to me, she have a new standard. It's amazing. Christina Aguilera, to me, is one of the best voices ever. Yeah, yeah. And she, I think she's misused. What I saw her do with her voice, actually, they say is the only person, Bill, please correct me if I'm re retrieving the information incorrect, that she can hit every note. She can go back and forth every wow. note. I read that, and I was like, wow. And I hear her in different songs, and like, and again, Hollywood took it like a, put it on Disney movies and okay, but I saw her in a, in, a, in a concert live and like she went from every note and everything and that's when wow. I started researching and like that the reason her voice resonates so much with me. Mm. There's, um, there's a question I want to ask you, but put it in the context. So I, I want you to let people know how they can find you. But my question is, because I watched Gaga on that concert for the world that she organized, and it was just raw. I mean, she was sitting there at the piano with like a, a mobile phone capturing her performance. Um, what, when you see Gaga, what do you read? She's a really determined uh, person. Uh, she's determined, she's created, she's pragmatical. Uh, she's visual. That's one of the things that I, I think help her. Most people really think that she's audit. She's extremely visual. And that's how she put the two things together. Yeah, and yeah. after that, I hope she never ever touch her nose, because that might make it a, fi a, um, a fighter. She's a fighter. She's a survivor. Um, after I read Lady Gaga, I started looking on his story, history, and she was living in the same small apartment for years. She have a big storage for her clothing, but says I don't need a bigger apartment because I have more money. She's a fighter. She yeah. fought every step. She have that creativity on the tip of the nose and the round uh, forehead that he, she have every creative aspect. Everything has to do with the right part of the brain. That is creativity, watching in three dimensions and things like that. And I think that will make her who she is because you can have a great voice, but you don't do anything with her with that. Yeah. And she was creative enough. She created her own marketing. She, and when her sister says, um, I want to start singing again. She says, don't do it. Mm. This is a cage, a golden cage, but it's a cage because you're never going to recover your privacy again. And her sister decided not to go to music for that reason. So she's a grounded person related to what is, she's really calculating what she's doing, not in the bad way. And I, I wish I had it as a marketing or PR person. Seriously, right? Yeah. It's that. So, yeah, so definitely. It, if you sat down with Gaga, what would you say to her? What's the one thing like you would say to the woman who lost her child? What's the one thing you would say? What I said to Lady Gaga, um, why the way she chose to be perceived is so different than the way that she is? What, what, what is the line? Who yeah. you allowed to see who you are? She's like, um, <clears throat> it's not a marshmallow, it's like a s'more. You see when you have a s'more, it's really cracky on the, on the, <laughs> on the surface, but it's sweeted and yeah, mushy on the inside. She's, she's, a, she's, a, she's a one of those. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. 
That'd be a great question. When, it's, uh -huh. when Gaga comes on the show, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll say, well, Susan was on this show about, <laughs> we'll explain I can the question. Read, I can do a reading with her. I would love it. We have to tag, we have to tag, you know, Lady Gaga because she is fantastic. And the way you described it and how you, you know, you talked about the question, you know, you made me realize how much deeper things can be because I never, you know, maybe it's intuitive or something. Maybe it's skill sets to learn, but now I'm going to be looking at faces a lot different. So thanks, Susan, for opening me up to a whole new uh, pattern of uh, human interaction. That's pretty cool. And you know what? We are the only platform, and I don't want to sound cocky, but we are the only platform online teaching people how to read faces. I, um, I don't remember it was Einstein uh, who says, you don't have any right to take your knowledge to the tomb. So I have a couple mm. of mentees in the company that I'm training that are on the same level, and one of them is higher level than I am. Um, so we decide to incorporate phase rating. And more people says, well, people are going to stop hiring you as a consultant, but they're going to spread the word. Now, I, you're not going to start fighting with people. You're going to be start understanding people. So we are the only platform. We don't put all the classes together because people tend to like, I want to learn. No. You need time to yeah, process, yeah. like everything that you incorporate as an adult is practice. Bill, you know, I can give you the best piano in the world and the best cello and you destroy it. Or you use the piano to put the portraits on the top. You need to go with the scales first. I know, I know people who practice piano with a, p a painting piano on the table. I don't remember what was the composer who learned piano painting the... Yeah, the, with, with just no... Oh, the, just the no, notes no. painted on you the just table. did it by yeah yeah by so, the by the by listening yeah but you practice every day and, the field. Yeah. and I do practice every day and that's what I'm saying I like I'm giving you fifty percent what you need the other fifty percent is you now I yeah, give yeah. you a paper who says that you know the basic now take it to the next level that's depending on you that is a partnership I teach you you're complying. You complain, I'm never going to teach you. It's not my responsibility. So don't put it on me that you didn't yeah. learn. You didn't do the homework because it was easy to you to put it on me. It's humanbehaviorlab.com, right? Correct. Yeah, that's, it's easy to remember that, humanbehaviorlab.com. I love it. That's awesome. That's very cool. So what's the final words of wisdom that you have for our authentic human outliers, Susan? I don't have any wisdom. Why? Because <laughs> I'm 50 and still learning. My grand, all my grandparents live until the 100, so probably have 50 more two years. So maybe the day I die, I can give you wisdom, but I don't have all the wisdom in the world. I'm learning every day. I learn from talking to you guys things that I didn't know an hour before. I'm going to have new wisdom today when I'm going to sleep with the people that I'm going to interact. So my wisdom is never close the book because it's always another chapter you can be reading another chapter you can be writing and don't be so ignorant ignorance is not to know something and made a mistake ignorance and thinking that you know everything and don't talk to the elderly you don't talk to people you know everybody you know have something is an expert in something that you are not so give the ch yourself the chance to be blown away blow your mind for knowing that you don't have all the wins done. You have something to learn from somebody else. That has been yeah. my, one of my mottos. I don't have any wins done. I, I nobody to give advice, just to tell you what I do to try to become better. That was beautiful wisdom. Yeah, Thank I mean, you. awesome. You know, the human behavior specialist, but the most humble person that I've met, I think. And, and uh, that uh, it resonates, you know. And don't, I, and I'm, don't ruin my reputation, John. I'm not supposed to be humble or nice. <laughs> Remember, I'm the dark side. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I love that, you know. Okay, okay. She's, uh, she's somewhat humble. Thanks for being here, Susan. Thank you, guys. <laughs>